Welcome everyone to the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research uh, virtually. Um, we're pleased to have you here with us for this um, talk about this very important new book. Um, for those that don't know much about YIVO, I'll just say just a word. Um, YIVO is an archive and a library um, and a place for the contemplation and the celebration and the preservation of Jewish history and culture. Um, in our, our collections consist of more than 23 million documents and over 400,000 books that researchers and scholars from around the whole world um, use for their work. And we have a variety of educational activities, exhibitions, and public programs like this uh, that bring those collections to life and keep those stories going. So um, it's very meaningful for us to be able to present work um, that is using materials that we have in our archive, as is the case um, for this program. Uh, we'll be hearing about a new um, translation called May God Avenge Their Blood, a Holocaust memoir triptych of three memoirs by Yiddish writer Rachmiel Bricks. We'll be hearing today from Yermiahu Aaron Taub, the translator, and Bella Bricks Klein, Rachmiel Bricks' daughter and a, a cultural activist herself. So I'm going to just say a few words about each of them, and then I'll hand it over to Yermiahu, um, who will give a presentation followed by Bella, who's going to give another presentation, then we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. Yermiahu Aaron Taub is the author of six books of poetry and two books of fiction, including Beloved Comrades, a novel in stories. His most recent translation from Yiddish is May God Avenge Their Blood, a Holocaust memoir triptych by Rachmiel Bricks, which is the book we're going to be discussing today. Bella Bricks Klein is a Yiddishist, actively promoting Yiddish culture and language in Israel. She continues her father's legacy by lecturing over the world in Yiddish, English, and Hebrew. She has written and performs an autobiogra autobiographical musical one-woman show, My Father's Daughter. So without further ado, I'll hand the mic over to Yermiyahu. Thank you all for joining. Shalom Aleichem. Thank you to Alex and to Yivo for inviting us. Thank you all for coming to this program, celebrating the Yiddish writer Rachmiel Bricks and my new translation of three of Bricks' memoirs into English. And here's a copy of the book. Um, if, by the way, my voice ever gets too soft, just let me know, just wave. Maybe Alex can wave. Um, I'd like to thank Bella Bricks Klein, who will be speaking after me, for her tireless support of my translation project and for her ongoing advocacy of her father's work. In fact, it's through that advocacy that I even heard of Rachmiel Bricks in the first place. In 2017, I saw an ad in the Farvers, the Yiddish Forward, for a talk that Bella was going to give about her father at the Shalom Aleichem Cultural Center in the Bronx. And I asked our mutual friend, the historian and Yivo advisor, academic advisor, Dr. Cecile Kuznets, um, about this writer. And Cecile put me in touch with Bella and the rest, as they say, is history. Bella has done monumental work on arranging her father's vast collection in the Evo archives. So thank you, Bella. Um, I also want to thank the Yiddish Book Center that supported my work with the Translation Fellowship. So who is Rachmiel Bricks and why was I drawn to translating these memoirs? And here they are. Why do I find them significant? Rachmiel Bricks was an extraordinary writer in the humanist tradition. His work is characterized by a flair for lively description and narration, deep empathy for his characters, and a carefully calibrated attention to moral complexity. Even in the darkest of circumstances, he's interested in the humanity of all those he's observing, including perpetrators of evil. Bricks was particularly adept at capturing the dialogue of a wide spectrum of protagonists, Jews in the shtetl of every political and religious persuasion, passengers on trains, pedestrians on the street, concentration camp inmates and guards, among many others. His humanist interest is apparent in the carefully hewn folk style he perfected. Written in spare, almost documentary-like prose, his texts reverberate in emotional urgency and power. This understatement was quite purposeful. As he argued in How to Write Corbin Literature, translated by Joseph Lefwich. How can it, writing about the Holocaust, be done? By writing concisely, compressed, without embellishment, without adornment. We must not repeat. We must avoid any superfluous word and prose 
even more than in poetry. I hold that we must express the hardest thought in the simplest way so that everyone will understand. Divo Zaininishkebliden, those who didn't survive the first work in the triptych, is an elegiac, deeply affecting memoir of Brixis Shtetl Skarzysko Kamienna. And I forgot to share a screen. And here is Skarzysko Kamienna. And it's kind of between Radom and Kiels. And Lodge is up here. So you can see that some sense of where Skarzewski is in Poland. As its title demonstrates, Diva Zain and Nishkobitin eschews a self-focused approach, centering instead on the author's maternal great uncle, Mendel Feldman, a wealthy chassid with influence in the Jewish and Polish spheres. Indeed, the book's entire first passage is devoted to a physical description of the mental and a highly detailed one of his clothing. The reader gets to feel the weight, solemnity, and color vibrating beneath his extended sartorial meditation. Significantly, we learn early on that Rachmiel Bricks, the author, was named after a Mendel's learned father. Taken as a whole, this first book in the triptych is a part character study, part reportage, part collection of folkways and vignettes. The protagonists are colorfully described and these scenarios are expertly drawn. Bricks presents the shtetl's folk traditions and an extended cast of characters while always returning the thread back to Remendel. In the process, a vivid collection portrait of an annihilated Jewish community emerges. What initially appeared to be a hagiographic approach on the part of the author to the text's larger than life, almost mythical main character, slowly moves in quite a different direction altogether. It is certainly tempting to view Remendel's life and end as a metaphor for the fate of Polish Jewry itself. In this work, Brix's narrative approach is unconventional. There are no chapter breaks or readily apparent chronology. The book is more a panorama chock full of anecdotes, characters, customs, and details than a traditional memoir with a linear narrative tribe. We meet individuals from nearly every sector and political stripe of society, Jew and Pole, rich and poor and in between, men and women, religious and secular, Zionists and socialists. We meet Brix's maternal grandmother, Liebe, the sister of Remendel, who, like her brother, gave generously and un unhesitatingly to the poor. We meet Yidel Kogan, known as Yidele with the Fidele, who wasn't given a Jewish name because he was uncircumcised. And this was permitted by the rabbi because pre six previous sons had died as a result of circumcision. We meet Remendel's daughter, Esther Rivka, who elopes in marriage to a non chassid We meet the ne'er-do-well Shmulyayna, with his dreams of striking it rich and so many others. Here's a description by Bricks of Chaim Yankel Kakodurudu. Who was Chaim Yankel Kakodurudu? He was the leading lunatic of the shtetl, the son of a tailor and an old bachelor. Industrious, always engaged in the hard labor of carrying water, chopping wood, cleaning and sweeping. He worked at the bakeries. Whenever he was given a few groschens, he clapped his hands like a rooster flapping its wings before crowing. He even crowed like a rooster, cock -a doodle doo entertaining bystanders. The schoolboys in particular had fun playing around with him. In World War II on Simchas Tarda, as the Germans and Ukrainians liquidated the ghetto of Skarzysko Kamiena, Poland, Chaim Yanko cock -a doodle doo hid in the boiler of the mikveh where he was shot. Chaim Yanko Kakodurudu was a regular guest in Remendel's home too. And one of the things that I love about this passage is that there's so much compressed into it. We learn about Chaim Yanko's background. We learn about what he did. We learn about his connection to the other people in the shtetl. And we learn about his end. And then yet again, we learn about his connection to Remendel. 
In this book, we also learn how tea was cooked and kept heated on Shabbos, how weddings were celebrated, how prayer services were conducted, what kind of pastries were given at ritual circumcision ceremonies. Largely assuming the observational position of anthropologists, Bricks makes rich use of his powers of description and talents at capturing lively dialogue and compelling narration. Only occasionally does he insert himself into the events of the book. And these next slides were taken on a trip that my friend Pearl Gluck and I took in July 2018 to Poland. We began in Krakow, which features significantly in Dian Oifers, The Fugitives, the second book. We went to Auschwitz, where, Bir where Brix was interned. We also went to Birkenau. We went to Skarzysko Kamienia, as you can see here, uh, the setting of those who didn't survive. We went to Lodz, which is the setting for a lot of the Antlaifos, the fugitives. And then we went on to Warsaw. Here's a picture of the Kamienna River, which is so beautifully described. Um, this is the last house. Um, well, let me backtrack. So before I went, I got addresses from Bella. And this was given to her by a cousin. And this is believed to be the last house um, at which a Bricks family, the Bricks family lived. And this is um, what I found of the Jewish cemetery in Skarzysk. Um, in Diva Zayin Nishkoblivim, Bricks describes the destruction of the cemetery. So this is possibly some kind of reconstruction. Um, and the tombstone on the right, it says Sara Liba Basi Rachmil. And all those names are connected, but um, Bella does not know who this person is. And, it may not be a Brooks relative, but it's just a tombstone. I also saw the clock tower and the statue of the Polish freedom fighter Tadeusz Kosciuszko in Freedom Square Lodge, which is described in The Fugitives. I saw the covered gateways to the courtyards in Lodz that figure so vividly. Lodz was not bombed during the war, as we know, and the buildings in much of the city, the old part, are still intact. My friend and I stayed in one of those old buildings, and I like to imagine that it would not have been unlike the buildings that Bricks knew. It was extremely valuable for me as a translator to be in the settings that Bricks himself describes, and I feel fortunate to have made this, this trip. Okay, I'm gonna stop share. So, in The Fugitives, in contrast, to Diva Zainish Gablibin, Bricks himself emerges fully as a character. Here he describes his experiences from the breakout of the war in September 1939 until the establishment of the Lodge Ghetto in May 1940. He portrays the confusion and uncertainty in the population as the German army advances into Poland. In Lodge, the terror inflicted by the air raids, the race to shelter, the search for food as supplies dwindle are captured to great effect. Mass media plays a pivotal role in the narrative as Bricks highlights the interplay between actors shaping the events of world history and everyday people. Civilians seek to comprehend the increasingly incomprehensible developments they hear about on Polish radio. But the propaganda only foments chaos and panic. The effects of propaganda are visible throughout The Fugitives and From Agony to Life, the third book, in both the dialogue spoken and actions taken by numerous individuals Bricks encountered in the war years. Some of the most powerful scenes in the fugitives are of the citizens of Ludge on the move, crowding the highways with their valuables piled up, desperate to escape the bombings. The German net is ensnares Bricks and many others, and he experiences the horrors of captivity at the hands of the Nazis even before his internment in the Ludge ghetto. He depicts the depth of anti-Semitism in the Polish population, but also the moments of kindness shown him and others. Consider this passage from the fugitives. When we arrived in the village, we saw that all of the cottages were full of fugitives who were returning home. The peasants received them hospitably. They cooked potatoes for them and they gave them milk. In the field, I spotted a poorly maintained old cottage with a straw roof. I said, Let's try over there. When we approached, a young peasant woman with a small child greeted us warmly. There wasn't a single fugitive here. 
Is that it? Is the war over? She naively asked. Praise Jesus Christ. In that case, my husband will also be coming home. Maybe you've seen him somewhere. He was taken for military service two weeks ago. How naive she is, I thought. The war has only just begun. And her husband? Perhaps the Germans have captured him. Or who knows, he might have fallen on the battlefield. I envisioned her as a young widow with a little orphan. I comforted her. Sister, your husband will certainly come home. But it will take a while because he has to go by foot. And it's a long way from here. On her young, beautiful face, a hopeful smile emerged. But just as quickly, she grew pensive and her sadness returned. The woman quickly peeled and cooked potatoes and warmed up some milk. We ate and were refreshed. Then she cut two pieces of homemade black bread for us and said, the mill is still standing, but who knows when I'll be able to ground rye to bake bread. The bread tasted delicious. I marveled at her generosity. After the meal, I took out money to pay her, but she didn't want to accept it. After I pleaded with her, she finally relented and accepted the money. She said we could sleep in the attic on the hay or in the, sta or in the stable on the straw. We went into the stable, closed the gate, and lay down on the straw. Bricks and his fellow traveler debated whether to stay a while at this Polish woman's house. Bricks allowed himself to be convinced to go back on the road sooner than he wanted. This decision not to stay would have fateful consequences for them both. In contrast to Holocaust memoirs that, that gloss over the events at the beginning of the war or begin with the internment in the ghettos, the fugitive dramatically delineates the hopes, uncertainty, and mounting desperation at the early stages of the war before the Nazis tightened their chokehold over Poland and mastered the machinery of industrial scale genocide. I am not aware of any memoir that portrays this period with such detail and power. The final work in the triptych, Vom Sisse zum Leben, From Agony to Life, charts Brix's deportation to experiences in and liberation from Auschwitz and other internment camps. His depiction of the camp experience is relentless. The effects of starvation, privation, and brutality on the body and the soul, the tedium in the camps, and the terror in being shunted from one camp to another are rendered with stark clarity. Bricks probes the dark recesses of human agency, sparing no one, least of all himself, from his own unflinching eye. He finds moments of connection and courage amidst the conditions of extremity. His belief in art as a life force and his commitment to his own calling as an artist is a leitmotif in this and indeed all the three works translated. So that's something about the books that I've translated. Now I'd like to speak just a bit about Bricks himself. Born and raised in the Hasidic milieu in Skarzysk in 1912, Rachmiel Bricks was a prolific and highly acclaimed Yiddish poet and writer. He was the third of eight children. At the outbreak of World War II, he was in the industrial city of Ludge, working as a hat maker and house painter. Most of his family perished in Treblinka. His brother Yitzchak perished in Auschwitz in 1944. His brother Simcha Lazar served in the Polish army against the Nazis and helped liberate Poland. In June 1946, a Polish nationalist, so after the war, a Polish nationalist shot and killed Simcha and his bride, Sonia Milstein, two days before their wedding. And in the Evo archives, there are really powerful letters from Simcha to Rachmiel about numerous topics, including um, when he first met Sonia and is falling in love with Sonia. Of his immediate family, only Rachmiel, his brother Yosef, and his sister Liba Lucha survived the war in its aftermath. Bricks was interned in the Lodge Ghetto from 1940 to 1944, and Bella is going to talk a lot more about that, where he continued to write and participate in literary events. In August 1944, he was transferred to Auschwitz and later to Wattenstadt, Ravensburg, and Volklin. And now I'm going to go back to share a screen. After the war, he made his way to Stockholm, Sweden, where he met Hinda Irene Wolf. In 1946, the two married. They had two daughters, Miriam Sarla and Bella Svea. In conjunction with his public literary engagements in Stockholm, 
Ricks was already writing about his experiences during the war. For example, he dated the writing about Kiddush Hashem, Stockholm, 1947 to 1954. In the Bricks collection in the Evo archives, I found a clipping from the Farros, the Yiddish forward that notes that Bricks was then a resident of Stockholm and that his poetry and prose on the Lodge ghetto had been translated into Polish and Swedish. His writing on the Holocaust therefore did not emerge after a long period of repression and thus it had a sense of immediacy and depth of color. Even at the stage immediately after the war, Bricks did everything in his power to render his trauma visible. In addition to his literary work, Bricks was quite active in Sweden on behalf of the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research. He collected materials from the Jewish communities in Stockholm, including from the displaced persons milieu. The aforementioned article notes that he was a special correspondent in Sweden for YIVO. He was also awarded his own stamp as a collector. Upon the completion of an exhibit at YIVO entitled Jews in Europe 1939 to 1945, Dr. Max Feinreich, director of research at EVA, wrote to Bricks, we want to thank you so much, dear friend, for everything you did to make the exhibit what it is today and for all the important documents you sent us. Additionally, Bricks played a crucial role in getting the Nachman Zonaben collection of primary source documents from the Lodge Ghetto to EVA. He met with Zonaben in Stockholm on numerous occasions and convinced him to send materials to EVA. Feinreich wrote to Bricks. Attached, you will find a copy of our letter to Mr. Zonabend. We greatly appreciate your efforts to obtain the documents for the Evo archives. We ask you to continue to work on our behalf in conjunction with the current letter to him. See to it that he send us more as soon as possible. See to it also that the packages are well packed. As for payment for the documents, as Zonabend suggests, it simply can't be considered. We're sure you'll do everything you can so that we receive the documents. And for that, we thank you so much in advance. Given the attention to folklore so evident in his memoirs, Bricks's work as a YIVO collector in Sweden was clearly a part of his larger project of documenting and honoring the way ordinary Jewish folk live. Indeed, his vast collection of his own papers and effects that he donated to YIVO revealed that his impulse towards collecting and documenting remained with him throughout his life. In March 1949, the family emigrated from Sweden to the United States, and Bricks devoted the next 25 years until his death to writing about the Holocaust, sending selections of his work out to periodicals, corresponding with Yiddish writers and editors. Get some water. submitting articles and opinion pieces to Yiddish newspapers and participating in the world of Yiddish letters. In addition to Young Green May, Young Green May, which came out in 1939, the aforementioned Avkidish Hashem, for the sanctification of God's name, and the three memoirs translated in this volume, Bricks also published three books on his four years in the large ghetto. These are the testimonial novels, Der Kesa and Ghetto, the King or the Tsar of the Ghetto, and the Papier and Ekroin, as well as the long poem Ghetto Fabrik, Sachsen Zipsik, Ghetto Factory 76. And this is something that I found of interest in the Evo archives. So there's an article in Der Tag in 1950, which talks about how um, the one copy of Jung Grimai that survived. Um, Bricks had given it to the left Leiber Zionist leader Zerubbabel as a gift. And after the war, Zerubbabel sent it back to him. Um, in the Antleufers, there's a long passage about when Bricks discovers that all the books, uh, all the co extant copies of Jung Green Mai have been destroyed. It's this absolutely wrenching, gut wrenching moment. So the copy that is in the Evo library is obviously a photocopy. Um, and I believe it's also in the JTS library. And the extant copy, the one extant copy that Drew Bovell sent back to Bricks after the war is uh, in Bella's possession. 
Briggs's writing was highly regarded in Yiddish, Yiddish's circles and beyond. He won praise from the Nobel laureates Agnon, uh, Shinyu Agnon, and also Isaac, Isaac Besheva Singer. Um, Dr. Critics such as Dr. Mugdoni, scholars of Yiddish, Irving Howe, and Saul Lipson. He worked hard to disseminate his work and cultivated extensive friendships among Yiddish literati. And I'll read just a few really quick excerpts. In a letter to Brick's uh, scholar, the anthologist, Ezra Corman wrote, I've received your book, Akedash Hashem. I read your book in one sitting and I couldn't sleep. I have no words to describe, to express my emotional experiences. Your Akats is an artistic achievement. Avram Rezin wrote, Kiddush Hashem is a great work for all generations. This is the strongest of the Holocaust literature. And Dr. Mukdoni wrote, everything the Rachmiel Bricks writes is important, both as historical material and as artistic creation. He possesses the sharp eyes of an artist that penetrate within, as if with x-ray vision, into the souls of people. His work has been translated into numerous languages, including Hebrew, German, and Italian. And here's a picture of him with his English translator, um, S. Morris Engel. The novella, A Cat in the Ghetto, was turned into a stage play called The Windows of Heaven, um, also called Resort 76, by Shinton Winselberg. And there were productions in Stockholm and London. And here's a program, again, all from the Evo archives of the Windows in Heaven program in England, and here's the cast. His work was the subject of two literary symposia held in New York in 1964 and 69, and over 400 people attended the 64 symposium sponsored by the Herzl Institute. The Tag Morgan Journal reported that Dr. Sidney Rosenthal introduced Bricks as one of the most important writers of our time. As a translator, Brix's work presented a number of challenges in addition to all the usual ones that come with translation. Each of the three books required the mastery of specific vocabularies, Hasidic clothing and folkways in the first, the language of war in the second, the vocabulary of mass incarceration and genocide in the third. So those are all three very different milieus. Additionally, the worlds mapped out in all three books included languages other than Yiddish, Hebrew religious, as well as the Polish, as well as Polish in the first, Polish and German in the second, Polish and just a tiny bit of Russian in the third. Bricks himself often used a Polish term and then included a Yiddish definition. In such cases, I followed his own lead by retaining the Polish term, but changing the parenthetical Yiddish to English. Throughout, I often retain the Polish and German in the text and define them in a glossary. My goal was to present the multilingual nature of his world rather than present a completely seamless English. The glossary of terms is extensive. And besides the glossary, I created a dramatis personae that provided a long list of characters known to Bricks that may well be unfamiliar to English readers. A number of these perished in the Holocaust. As I included them, I was aware that this dramatis personae was itself a kind of memorial to those who perished, an elaboration upon Brix's own. Widely known for his poems, novellas, and stories, it is my hope that the publication in English of Brix's previously untranslated memoirs will further enhance his reputation. Bringing these three works together into a single volume allows the English language reader to view his portrayal of the interwar shtetl, the early days of World War II, and the prison camps in a single reading experience. It illuminates not only the horrors of the Holocaust, but also phenomena not often seen in Holocaust literature, the beauty and complexity of Jewish life so brutally destroyed, as well as the freneticism of the early war days. I am delighted that new readers can now appreciate these autobiographical works from a gifted and versatile Yiddish writer whose life and creativity were cut short by his premature death, an artist who remained steadfast despite challenges and immense affliction in his commitment to his folk and his art. And now over to Bella.
Oops. Can you hear me? Yep, you sound great. Okay. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Yivo. Thank you, Alex, for inviting us to discuss this book. Uh, Yivo, today, it's a very meaningful book talk for me because Yivo was significant and an integral part of my father's life. Uh, I'd like to thank also Yermiaho for his wonderful, accurate translation of my father's books. It is important to tell my father's story. Uh, when I hear someone who denies the Holocaust or doubts that it took place, it makes me very upset and very angry because I know that it took place. Both my father and my mother suffered and survived, but they lost a major part of their family, parents, sisters, brothers, cousins. Um, my father felt that it was his mission as a witness to tell the world what the Germans did to the Jewish people between 1939, 1945. Uh, In the first book in uh, this uh, trilogy, Divus and Nishkoblib and Those Who Didn't Survive, uh, I enjoy reading and rereading this book because I get a chance to be acquainted with my grandparents and the traditions and the superstitions of the shtetl skajisk because all of them were murdered and I never got a chance to meet them. Um, why doesn't this move? Just a moment. In uh, 2011, my sister Miriam and I flew to Poland to see Skajis Kamiena. I wanted to see what remained of the Jewish community that lived there centuries and was so important in developing the city, the town. All I found was an obelisk, a monument on the outskirts of, of the town. And it was very disappointing. The other two books in this uh, new book uh, tell about the before the war and his liberation. It ends with my father being brought by the Red Cross to Sweden and looking forward with a lot of hope. In Stockholm, my father and other Jewish fugitives, refugees, uh, were brought there. And uh, since he was a poet before the war, my father went to the various Jewish uh, communities and he recited and he encouraged them to go on with life. And at one such evening, he met a young Romanian woman, Hinda Etcha, Irene, Wolf, and they fell in love and they got married in the main synagogue of Stockholm. And my sister and I were also born in Stockholm. As Yermiahu related, my father, Papa, became the official Yivo representative in Sweden and mailed its director, Max Weinreich, many important documents, including the Zonnebund ar archives. A great deal of correspondence can be found in my father's large archive in the Yivo for which I prepared a finding aid. Papa had applied for immigration to the United States as he wanted to live in New York City, which was the center for Yiddish writers and for the Yiddish press. And with the aid of Yivo and Hayas, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, the family arrived in New York in March 1949. My sister Miriam and I received the Yeshiva day school education. And at home we received an East European education 
you could see that my mother even dressed us in an East European style in the center of Manhattan. The Yiddish language was very important to my father and he wanted his children to know it. And we were not permitted to speak any language other than Yiddish in the house. Uh, I was about five, six years old and my father used to sit with me every evening. He used to read Yiddish classics to me like uh, Peretz's Oivnit Nochecher, Shulam Aleichem's Dos Mestel, and he used to teach me to read, to write, and to sing Yiddish. We had a little book. This is the original book, which I have, and Mein Aleph Bess by Kaminsky, where for every uh, Yiddish letter, there was a cute little poem. For example, for Aleph, it was Itzik. Itzik spitzig piper noter, dreite meg beim schwarzen Kuter, macht sich bin papier a schwerdel, nehmt us stecken, fahr a ferdel, oi, ist us an Itzikl. And another one that I enjoyed, Yud, Yankel. Yankel, bankel, bull, 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 macht a reise auf a stuhl, mit a hittel auf a seit, furt sich Yankel weit, weit, weit. One of my earliest memories is my father sitting and writing. He had a fountain pen and he wrote on white ruled paper. He always wore a white shirt and a tie and jacket when he sat down to write. I believe that's because he wanted to give respect to the characters about which he was writing. Murray and I could not fully understand what he was writing about, but we knew it was important. Murray and I used to play quietly in our room and we would make a little bit noise. My mother would come rushing in with her finger on her lips saying, Sha, Papa schreit, shh, Papa is writing. Mama created an environment conducive to my father's writing. I felt there was a certain intimacy, a bond, an understanding between them as they had both experienced the Chorben, the Holocaust. Mama also knew Yiddish well. The eminent scholar and researcher, Dr. Mordechai Schechter, interviewed my mother many times and learned from her about Yiddish traditions and proverbs in her native Romania. Mama was an exceptional mother, a wonderful balabusta, a homemaker. She kept a strict kosher home. She sewed, embroidered, prepared delicious meals, gulash, chulent. She baked kipalach, rogalach, lekach. The importance of food in our home cannot be overestimated. We were not permitted to leave any food on our plate, not even a crumb. Papa, could not keep a steady job because he was not in good health. We never had money at home. We were brought up with love and spirituality. Material things were not that important. Mama did not own any diamonds or furs. She used to say, Zeisen in meine Brillanten. They are my diamonds pointing to Miriam and to me. The truth is, my father, we could have had an easier life, but Papa refused to submit for Wiedergutmaching, for reparations from the German government. Papa was a man of principle. In his first book, he added a customized stamp declaring no German reparations money was used to print this book. He also refused to be included in the first lexicon von der Neue Yiddische Literatur, the lexicon of modern Yiddish literature, which was published in 1956 and financed by German reparations money. In my research at the Ringelblum Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw, I discovered that even in the large ghetto, Papa could have had an easier life. He resided before young people in an orphanage in the first months of the ghetto, and its director offered him to continue to recite before the group, 
ensuring him he would have regular meals. The only condition being that the director would select which literary pieces my father should read. And my father said, no, one does not dictate to an artist what he may or may not read. And so because of his principles, he starved in the ghetto for four years. I was, in essence, my father's secretary. I assisted him with writing letters in English, with his mailings, general office work. He used to take me along to the editor, editorial offices of the Yiddish newspapers on the Lower East Side, and sometimes meetings with Yiddish, other Yiddish writers. Papa was invited to speak to members of Yiddish-speaking communities in other cities in order to sell his books, the books that he had written. And he used to travel to cities like Miami, Baltimore, Montreal, Toronto. I remember he even went, once went to Havana, Cuba. He used to send us cute little postcards from uh, the various cities that he went to. Papa's book was translated, as Yirmiyahu mentioned, by S. Morris Sengel. It was issued at first in 1959 by Bloch, Bloch Publishing, then under Kiddush Hashem by Berman House in 1977, then by Percy Books in 2008, again, A Cat in the Ghetto. My father's stories and his uh, appreciation of folklore uh, had his stories included in various anthologies. This one is The Call of Memory, learning about the Holocaust through narrative. Also, he was included in When Night Fell, an anthology of Holocaust short stories. And the play that Yirmiyahu mentioned, uh, The Theater of the Holocaust book by Sklut, uh, is also included. It was dramatized by Shimon Winselberg. Even recently, it is being performed uh, in October 2019, hardly a year ago. I went to Whitewater for the debut of the performance of Resort 76. Uh, I'm very glad that I went. <laughs> the Holocaust, the Horden, was always present in our home. We grew up in its shadow every single day. My father never stopped talking about it. When he completed writing a new chapter, he used to gather the family together, usually on our beds in our bedroom, and would read the new chapter to us. Sometimes there was a difficult description, and Mama would say, Lion du snisch du schwer für die Kinder. Don't read that, it's too graphic for the children. And Papa would look up from his paper and say, nine, is I missen this no, they must know, and he would read it. Even 25 years after leaving the ghetto, my father was still under its effect. One summer after my husband and I visited our parents, my father accompanied, accompanied us to the bus stop. It was a lovely summer day. The sun was shining. There were flowers, butterflies. And suddenly my father went to the side of the road, tore off a twig from the tree, from a bush, came to me and said, Du seist Baila? Du sat man die Gessen in Ghetto. You see Baila? This is what we ate in the ghetto. Although it was a beautiful pastoral setting, Papa could not enjoy it. I realized at that moment that my father in his mind never left the ghetto. Pencils and paper were forbidden in the lodge ghetto, but my father told me that on the penalty of death, he had written prose and poetry in secret. He and other writers met at an underground literary group in the poet's Miriam Ulinova's house. Before the lodge ghetto was liquidated, 
he was, and he was sent to Auschwitz. Papa felt his manuscripts were important and he buried them in the large ghetto. Uh, just a moment. In the Yivo archives, I found this postcard from his youngest brother, Simcha. And in this postcard, he's answering my father in Sweden. And my father had asked him to look in Leut, Leutermierski Svelf. That was the street in Lodge where my father had buried his papers. The chances of finding them were slim, but miraculously, they found the manuscripts, they found the papers. And this was given to Nachman Blumenthal, then given to Zich, which is now the Ringelblum uh, Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. My father appealed to the Institute to receive copies of his writings, but they refused and demanded that my father come personally to Poland. My father did not travel to Poland as he vowed he would never again step on Polish soil. He passed away in October 1974 without knowing which of his manuscripts had survived. I realized that now it was my mission to go to Warsaw and bring to light his manuscripts, which had lain dormant and untouched for 65 years. After coordinating by email, my sister and I flew to Warsaw in 2011. This is the entrance to the Ringelblum Institute. I was given several folders and received permission to take photographs with my camera as the pages were too fragile to be photocopied. I took about 240 photos of his writings. When I returned to Israel, I transferred uh, all the files from the memory disk to my home computer. But when it was already in my computer, psychologically, I couldn't open them. Every time I attempted to, I got stomach cramps and a cold sweat. Subconsciously, I knew I would be seeing my father's suffering as it was happening. At that time, he was only 28 years old, like my youngest son. Only five years later, in 2016, I mustered enough emotional strength to look into the files. Uh, this is what he wrote on, pieces of paper that he found, uh, some of them, deciphering the papers was challenging. The papers got wet, they were run on sentences. I analyzed the manuscripts uh, by, by genre, by theme, by date, and submitted it as my thesis for which I received a master's degree in Yiddish at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem under Professor Yechiel Scheintuch's guidance. And I am so proud of that. I found, oops, I found 40 poems here. You can see how hard it is to decipher. Uh, I found 40 poems, 31 narratives, 12 letters, six invitations. This is invitation for, it's in Polish in the Lodge Ghetto. You can see the date in 1940. And I also found his repertoire. This is one of the programs. I found uh, four different programs. And what was interesting for me, uh, of course, on top it says Mem Mem Samach, Mendel Moichus Studium. In other place, uh, other programs, there was Shulam Aleichem. That's understandable. And of course, his own uh, creation. But what I found surprising, the fifth name is Sinclair. And my father would read Boston Fragment, which to me was amazing, an American writer, which my father knew about. He never had a formal high education. Uh, he was an autodidact, and uh, he taught himself, self-taught. One of the poems I found, Nicht uh, I, I found in three versions. Uh, this is the latest one, which my father later copied in his own handwriting. Nishtrex Feifen, do not despair. Sis nora durchwein dicker wind, 
nicht verzweifeln, mein Kind. Wir sind in alte Bäume, tief und breit in der Erde verwurzelt, mit großen Kräunen, wo spazieren die Welt. Starke Sturmwinden können für uns die Blätter noch abreißen, die Zweige noch brechen, aber nicht die Kräunen. Starke, tiefe, verwurzelte Bäume können Winde nicht ausreißen, nicht auswurzeln. Wir sind in Bäume ewige, wo es geben die Welt eine Speisendicke. Wir wollen eibig sein. Es ist nur ein durchweindiger Wind. Nicht verzweifeln, mein Kind. This is the English translation. And uh, I wanted to mention that my parents uh, were very proud of the state of Israel. And they planned one day to make Aliyah after I came to live here. When Ben-Gurion came to Israel, sorry, came to New York for the first time as prime minister, there was a parade on Fifth Avenue. Uh, a passing journalist took a picture of us. So we're holding American flags and Israeli flags. Here are my parents. Uh, when my father passed away in New York, in October 74, my mother decided to bring him for burial in Israel. And he's buried on Harazetim, the holiest place in, in Yerushalayim. And my mother bought the plot next to him and she passed away 26 years later. And uh, I guess they made Aliyah after their death. Uh, it is a meaningful time right now because my mother just had a yurt site, Erev Rosh Hashanah. Uh, 20 years, and my father will have a yurt site 46 years, Cholomoed uh, Suko, in uh, 10 days. My father wrote me a dedication in his book. Mein liebe Tochter Baila Svea, am Matuna mein Seiferl, geschaffen mit Jesidim in Tränen, als ein geistige Matzeiver für deine Eltern, Eltern und Mischbucha. Du bist dann umgebracht geworden durch die Deutschen und seine Mithelfer, ich mach Schmamm in Tafschin, Tafschin, hey. Ich bin sicher, als die, was fortsetzen meine Idee mit schäferischen Wort, sei mit der Feder und sei der Pe. And in uh, English, a gift to you, my book created with agony and tears as a spiritual monument for your grandparents and family who were murdered by the Germans and their collaborators, may other names be blotted out during the years 1940-1945. I am certain that you will continue my idea creatively with your written word as well as with your spoken word. I realized later that this was in essence his will. And with this Zoom, I carried out his will. Thank you very much. That was so beautiful. Thank you so much, Bella. Thank you. Um, wonderful presentations, both. Um, fascinating, important work, uh, very moving. So we have a few minutes now for questions. If anyone has any questions, I ask you to please submit them in the Q&A box um, rather than the chat. It's a little bit easier to keep track of them if they're in one place. So in the Q&A box right there, um, write your questions. And I'll, I'll start off with a question while we give people a moment um, to process what they'd like to hear about, which is that um, both of you do really interesting, fascinating work in your in your own right, separate from this project, um, separate from lifting up this important legacy that you're talking about. Um, Yermiyahu as a poet um, and also a translator of other works, um, and Bella as a cultural activist um, in Israel, and I was wondering if maybe you could both speak a little bit about your other work and how this figures into it. Hear me out. Oh, I was going to have you take it first. <laughs> um, so I could gather my thoughts. Um, let's see, what do I want to say? So. Um, yeah, as Alex said, I write in English and Yiddish. Um, I write poetry and prose and um, kind of move back and forth between the two languages. Um, 
I, I mean, English is the language I'm most comfortable in, but Yiddish is obviously really important to me. So um, to me, um, there are just so many um, amazing writers that um, need to get out there. And I feel like Rachmiel Brix is one of them. Um, he's already out there in a lot of ways, but to bring him out to a new generation um, and in new ways and bring out new works of his um, so I, for me, it's like all of a piece, uh, which is to say it's all about celebrating Yiddish and Yiddish culture. And I feel like there's just so little that's known. I feel like the actual margin of, um, or, you know, percentage of Yiddish writers that have actually been translated is really small. So people have this very set notion of like what Yiddish is. So maybe they've heard Shalom Aleichem, or maybe they've heard about parrots. Maybe they've heard about parrots. Mandela, probably not. And then beyond that, like all the amazing writers and all the ways um, that in a very short time, um, Yiddish literature created this um, kind of, yeah, I mean, this extraordinary world literature, I think. So I see myself just taking my place among, you know, the many translators um, who are now being nurtured formally by the Yiddish Book Center um, and other programs, including the Yiddish Summer Program. In fact, I first um, got in touch or connected with translation through the Yiddish Summer Program when I was a student there many years ago. And Jeffrey Chandler was my translation workshop teacher. So um, to me, it's, it's all of a piece. And as a writer myself, um, I enjoy um, kind of connecting deeply with um, another writer through the art of translation. There's something profoundly intimate about, you know, just this kind of deep burrowing, cleaving um, for, you know, many, many months um, with, with a writer's words, trying to figure out, is this what he's saying? Is that what he's saying? Um, there are a lot of challenges in every sentence. So anyway, I could go on, but um, I'm going to hand it over to Bella. Uh, thank you. Um, I uh, am very much involved in uh, the Yiddish world in Israel. And what I try to do, I see what's missing. And I fill that role. <laughs> I uh, coordinate with Beit Leivik, Beit Shulam Aleichem, the... Uh, uh, what's called uh, the National Authority for Yiddish Culture. Uh, and uh, I saw that there was, for example, I was also director of Arbutering until it closed a year ago. I issue a monthly bulletin called Vus Venvu, which gives the um, events that are taking place all over Israel that relate to Yiddish, whether it's in Hebrew or English, uh, I feel it's very important to draw new people in, and not just uh, the older generation. Uh, I feel that I'm continuing father's, my father's legacy because Yiddish was very important for him, and I would like Yiddish to go on. And as Yermiao mentioned, there are so many books, so much Yiddish literature that has not been translated, that has yet not been available, become available to other audiences. And... Um, I would like that also to happen. Like uh, I'm doing my small part, at least helping with uh, translating my father's works because I feel if I don't do it in my generation uh, with my knowledge of Yiddish, with uh, my deciphering of this handwriting, with my strong will, with my feeling of immense responsibility, I think uh, his poetry, his works, uh, well, I feel like I'm rescuing them from oblivion. And I feel that, at least in my family, I don't see any continuity. I don't see anybody mishiga enough <laughs> to devote so many days and weeks and months like me to uh, preserving and uh, dispensing Yiddish literature, especially my father's. I feel this is my mission and I'm devoting uh, all my time to that. Beautiful. 
Um, so we have a few different questions about um, the different manuscripts and publications, both um, what went into this project and in general. Um, so maybe, maybe Bella, could you just kind of go through what was published um, during his lifetime and what manuscripts exist um, separate from that? Okay. Um, and also someone said they missed where, where you found those manuscripts. Oh, sorry, okay. where your father had hid those manuscripts. Okay. I also did not know where uh, they were hidden and I was uh, young, raising a family and I didn't ask all the questions that I would have today asked him, were, would my, were my father alive? So I only found out from this postcard that I showed in the Evo, that was an address in Lodge, in the ghetto, where my father asked his brother who went back to look for it. And as I said, even though the chances were slim, miraculously, they did find it. And it's in the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. As far as the books, uh, my father uh, put out, okay, if Kiddush Hashem, as a matter of fact, uh, I have everything here. <laughs> Bear with me a second. I think I have them here. The first book, Oif Kiddush, can you see it? Oif Kiddush Hashem, which includes a Katzen Ghetto. This is about Auschwitz and um, larger ghetto. The second book, the Papira Nekroin, which came out uh, a few years later. This is about, I'm sorry, their case in ghetto. It's about Mordechai Munkowski, the elder of the ghetto. The second half of that book, the Papir and the Crown, the Paper Crown, also about Rumkowski. Uh, Ghetto Fabric, one second, I missed the book. Ah, Ghetto, Ghetto Fabric, Ghetto Factory, it's half English, half Yiddish, which is a ballad my father wrote in the Lodge Ghetto, and he read it at a banquet, and he was put on the list to be deported to uh, Auschwitz, but he was saved because someone, there were some other writers who had protectia. And the last book is the Antleufus of Gesisa zum Leben, which is two thirds of the book that Yermiaho so wonderfully translated. So uh, all the Yiddish books came out in my father's lifetime, and uh, two that were translated into English. Uh, there were some translated into Hebrew as well. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I did mention, yeah, Divus uh, and So uh, I'm sure my father is looking down now and saying, oh, the Yivo, wonderful, because it was an integral part of his uh, life. And he's very, um, very, very pleased that Yirmiyahu decided to translate his books and so well. Thank you. Um, another really quick question for you, Bella. Um, to what, uh, in what language did you write your dissertation? Uh, I wanted to write it in Yiddish, but there weren't enough uh, professors to check to be able to go. So I wrote it in English because I wanted my children and my nieces to be able to read it and understand it. Someone on YouTube has asked, um, did, uh, Rachmiel Bricks, after the war, write at all about the way that survivors were treated in, during the post-war period? Aha, very interesting question. Because I found, again, in the Yivo archives, I found a manuscript and my father started to write about how um, the uh, Jewish people who were uh, there was an organization that was supposed to take care of the refugees. They, today we call them survivors. Uh, and he was very disappointed. So he started to write about that. And I interviewed my father uh, a few years before he passed away. And I have on tape that he was planning to write about New York. Unfortunately, he passed away at the age of 62. And he had a lot of plans. So that's why I feel this was some responsibility to make up for what he didn't manage to do. Can I chime in also on that one? Please. Um, 
in the Evo archives, there are numerous letters. So the Evo archives collection really shows his life in the post-war period in great detail. So for anyone out there who's looking for a topic, I mean, there's a lot to look through. And I mean, there are letters, you know, from um, the Paris Schreiberverein about, you know, we can give you a little sum of money to help. There's really a lot about his struggle in America also. So if you're, I mean, obviously we, could, we had so much to talk about in our talk, we couldn't fit everything in, but um, there's a lot of documentation on, um, if you want to understand Brix's situation in the US, um, there's a lot in the EVO archives on that. And I'll just add for those curious, um, not only is his archive really an incredible resource at EVO, but also the Zonabend archive that was mentioned um, did make its way to EVO. And it's really a kind of unbelievable, staggering, um, you know, documentation of the Lodge Ghetto. And it's, uh, there's a lot of kind of unbelievable material in it. Um, Mitchell asks, uh, to what did your father attribute his survival? Well, my father believes that those, the others who were interred with him in the Lodge Ghetto knew that he was a writer and he wanted, sorry, they wanted him to survive so he could write uh, about what happened. And uh, they gave him pieces of their bread so that he would continue uh, living and survive to write. So we've, we've a lot of very nice, kind messages, um, but for now, that seems to be all the questions. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Something else just came in. Um, uh, Beth, Beth asks um, for some clarification about the word churben. Is this the Yiddish word for Shoah? Yes. Or is there a slightly different nuanced meaning? she asks. Well, I know at home, we never heard the word Holocaust. My tata tumid gezuk im chorben. He always said chorben, which meant Holocaust. Chorben, ze lachrov, kidu, devastation or destruction. Uh, and this is the, the Yiddish word. Yermiao, you agree with me? Chorben. So, yes, I mean, as Bella was saying, chorban is a Hebrew word for destruction. So we say chorban based on mikdash but you know, the destruction of the Holy Temple. But in Yiddish, when people say Chorban, they mean the Holocaust. So whereas Shoah in Hebrew means Holocaust, even though the word Chorban is of Hebrew origin. But yeah, in Yiddish, it's the word for Holocaust. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to mention uh, that I still have a lot to do concerning my father's works. I would like to organize uh, the uh, archive, there were about 40 cartons, very, very wide uh, archive, and I would like to have it online uh, so that when you look on the YIVO website, uh, right now it says this collection has not been organized. And when I saw that, I got a zet, so I said, oh my God, I have got to do that. So that's on my list. I want to do a website for my father. I want to write a book. I want to publish the uh, manuscripts that were found in Warsaw. They're there. Of course, they wouldn't, even though uh, we're the next, the inheritors, the next generation, I can't get them out. <laughs> They're there. Uh, I would like to also make copies for the Yivo archive so that this archive will also have what's in that archive. <laughs> so I have a lot of things that I still want to do. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for all of the wonderful work that you've done on this. Um, and for sharing this with uh, Yivo and with our audience today. And we really look forward to, to this, uh, the, what's to come of all of that we're, we're talking about. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Adanka, shenem dan. Agit this year. Omein. 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 Bye-bye.